Hey there, I'm Rye Myers, your Broadway and entertainment BFF, and you're watching another episode of my live digital talk show series, Live with Rye. Before we begin, I just want to take a moment to thank you all for your continued love and support. I know I say that often, but you have no idea how much it means to me, and time has gotten away from me, and I can't believe that it has been a year since I first launched Live with Rye. What a whirlwind it has been. We're now in season three. It's all because of you and your support, and I can't thank you enough. But listen, I need your help. Do me a big favor. If you're watching, subscribe to my YouTube channel so you never miss an episode of Live with Rye. Hit that subscribe button and you can see every time I go live at 6 p.m. on Tuesdays or any other content I post. I have a lot of exciting things coming up, so make sure you're subscribed. And listen, I love being able to bring you some of the best interviews with some of the best people in the entertainment, Broadway, pop culture industry, and being able to continue my platform as your Broadway and entertainment BFF but I can't do it without you. So if you are so inclined and able to, would love if you'd continue to uh, be able to some support me, you can scan this fancy link right here uh, if you're on a computer, or you can uh, see my Venmo link at the bottom right here and shoot me a Venmo if you'd like. Again, you can scan this Venmo code, or you'll see my Venmo at Rye underscore Myers in the bottom, scrolling throughout the interview, and send me a donation if you'd like to help me support the show and the platform. It means more than you know. And now I'm very excited to welcome today's special guest, someone who has created something that is life-changing, that is really record-breaking, earth-shattering, um, and it's going to be really special. And I cannot wait to talk to Ryan about this. So please help me welcome my very special guest, Ryan Bauer-Walsh. Hey, Ryan. Hi there, Ryan. It's nice to talk to you. Yes, it's great to talk to you as well. And great first name. I love another Ryan. Hey. <laughs> Oh, so how are you doing? I'm good. Uh, October. Why is it like this? Who who said this was okay? There's too much going on. <laughs> um, yeah. Back to school for sure. But good. Good otherwise. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It's insane for sure. But you know, hey, I'll take I'll take it. Um, you know, being that it's October and we're busy, how are you holding up after coming out of these last 18 months uh, in quarantine? And what did it teach you? Oh, um, wow. It taught me a lot, actually. I mean, that was such a cocoon for so many people. I saw so many people come through this process learning way more about themselves than we would have if we were just kind of submitting to the capitalist regime of like nine to five. But uh, all that time, I don't know, it gave me a lot of uh, time to think about who I want to be. And especially some of the things that happened to me during that period really changed my perspective on who I could be. Um, and I came out of it a, a different person and a, a happier one, um, despite all the struggles that I think a lot of us went through. There was so much empathy available um, that it didn't ever feel lonely though. So that was really nice. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I think that that's absolutely wonderful. Um, so you've written an incredible new album called The Rainbow Lullaby, the first ever LGBTQIA plus lullaby album. Um, I understand it was created in memory of your mother. Tell us, take me back, tell me a little bit about the concept, the creation of this, and a little bit more about The Rainbow Lullaby. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, where to begin? Uh, well, June of the beginning of quarantine, remember it happened like March is when it all kind of closed down. Uh, I was supporting myself as a painter, um, working alone in my my studio that was up on 149th in Harlem. And then I got a phone call from my mom about three months into that saying it was time to come home. Um, her cancer had come back and I sold all of my paintings that I'd basically ever created. My friends and strangers pitched in. I cut my prices in half and they bought basically everything and paid for me to go home. And I spent the next four months taking care of my mother. Um, and then it it happened. She she passed away on October 28th of last year. And it was just like earth shattering. Um, anyone who's lost a parent, there's this sense of gravity that really disappears from underneath you. And I was literally dissociative. Like I, I didn't relate to this plane of existence. And a lot of us didn't in that period anyway, because our concept of reality had been shattered by this pandemic. Uh, and I was living in my childhood home's basement <laughs> Uh, with just me and my dad surrounded by like this tomb of archaeology uh, and childhood memories. And I knew that I wasn't going to get through that with any kind of positive path forward unless I started creating some coping mechanisms. 
And uh, creativity has always been something that I think challenges the nature of destruction. It's more powerful and it always will be. So I, I came up with a couple of projects for myself. Uh, one was uh, Banana Ducks, which is what I'm wearing now, which is my clothing line I just released with Tin Pin uh, with my friend Scott, which has been such a like beautiful journey into um, curing some gender dysphoria. I recently affirmed my pronouns as he, they. And also then I, I had these songs I'd written about 14 years ago um, and continued to write, but never did anything with. And I called my friend Fred Souter and I said, hey, do you want to turn these into lullabies? I want maybe a husband, maybe kids someday. And I'd like to be able to sing something to them. Uh, and it just started like really that simply grassroots. But then we thought we had something. We Googled and there were no other albums that existed, which was shocking until you remember that we lost all of our role models to a pandemic as well. Um, we didn't have a lot of gay role models. So now Broadway Records picked up the demo that I recorded under the stairs of my parents' basement. And I moved back to New York into a new apartment. And now there's a team of 50 plus people, almost all LGBTQIA. Uh, I think it's actually only Marissa Rosen, who is gay by association. <laughs> Um, who is, uh, we are all creating this album together, which, which is this really beautiful story about how um, if we all join together and everyone's welcome, then tomorrow is a place we can get to and it will be better there. Wow, it will be better there. Yes, that's if we can get to tomorrow. I love that, wow. Well, I mean, I love that you took tragedy and turned it into this. I wish that it never happened to you. And again, I send all of my love and support and condolences to you. Um, I'm so, so sorry. But I love that you've been able to get a team of close to, you know, 49 people, you said, to do this that are all, you know, LGBTQIA. How did you decide which artist you wanted to perform on this album? Because you have some great ones, Jen Colella, Caitlin Cunanan, uh, Matt Doyle, all these great people. Mark Shaman helped uh, with the writing. So how did you decide all of this? Well, after working in New York as an actor for since 2006, the mm -hmm. first thing I said was, they have to be the nicest people you've ever met. <laughs> and this team is, they're just joyful um, and they're full of grace. And then from there, it was really like, well, what kind of variety can we have? How many voices are we able to connect with, to help represent as many people in our community as possible? One of the biggest things about this album is that it has a really broad span of representation uh, as far as what voices children will hear singing them to sleep. And we really wanted children to like hear their own parents on this album, their own family identity, whether it's two mommies, two daddies, or uh, other specific cultural backgrounds that were important to that family. I really wanted to kind of engage with all those communities because within the LGBTQIA plus community, there are so many really important and crucial communities that we wanted to participate. And I, I think we came close, but thank goodness, there's always more diversity available. And I'm hoping that we can do another one of these and expand it by another 25 songs in the future. That would be awesome. That is really, really special and such a privilege for you to undertake. I mean, what a great honor. What do you hope that, you know, people, and specifically parents will take away from this album? Um, and perhaps, you know, not just obviously queer identifying parents, but, you know, non-queer identifying parents as well. What do you hope would, uh, the message will be that they take away from this beautiful album? Um, I think of lullabies as like an ancient, human cultural tradition, something that is innate in every parent is singing your child to sleep. And I wanted this album to sound like it was created a thousand years ago and these songs have always existed and they're part of the human library of what it means to be a family. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of the most important aspect of this is that it creates this identity that gay families have always existed but now they're going to exist in a way that like comes from birth onwards. Um, just today, I read that there was a politician that said that gay people and trans people are filthy and children have no business being taught about them in schools. And the only thing I could think to reply, and usually I don't engage, <laughs> was to say, well, you know, 
we're not filthy. We're your siblings. We're families. We're, you know, and I think that the LGBT community was caught in a lot of stereotypes for a long time because it made people um, feel comfortable with us because they could put us in this tiny box of what a gay person was or a queer person was. And now uh, I'm expanding that to really not be heteronormative, but be human. Um, I want to rehumanize the queer experience so that people can identify with our humanity, not just our silliness or, you know, whatever stereotype that we've had projected onto us by culture for the last 20 years. Wow. I love that. Really important. And I did not know that that comment was made by a politician. And that is just... I'm not going to say his name because I'm not going to give him... I want you to. I don't, this is not a political <laughs> show. I think, but it's just that I'm basically just rolling my eyes because it's disappointing that still today we have um, you know people that think like that because that is not at all the case um so how did you um choose which songs you wanted to be on the album oh well <laughs> fred Souter and i we were like how many can we write what what i i would lay in bed at night and just try to write as many things as i could to get my mind off of the absolute grief that i was going through and i would you know, part of me since I was a little kid, I always wrote little songs on the swing set in my backyard. And right. it really just came naturally to me to use that as my primary coping mechanism. So I wrote like 16. Um, and then we kind of picked through my best ones, Fred's best ones, and that's how we made our demo. And then from there, we were like, well, how many, how many can we have, Broadway Records? And they said, please no more than 25. Apparently it gets tricky after 25. <laughs> So um, we got to 25 songs uh, and it was really a matter of con connecting, hi Meme, my cat saying hello, oh. um, connecting with as many different composers from as many different backgrounds to get as many perspectives on the album as possible. Um, I really wanted that to be one of the most important things that people carried away from this was that there's like the entire idea of the rainbow is that there's every color in it. And that is a, a really crucial task to creating this kind of catalog of songs. Um, so that was really important. Uh, and then just that they were actually like beautiful lullabies, like that a child could fall asleep to. That's, it, it's, it's literally a lullaby album. Um, the activism component is only there in a passive way. Uh, two, two male voices singing to a baby. It doesn't necessarily sound like a protest or anything or any kind of equal rights movement, but it in itself is a really beautiful way of saying, well, we're here and we are a family. Uh, so I kind of spoke to the composers about that as being an important through line with narrative. And I think that a lot of, um, no, all of them, everyone really connected to that idea and pushed that as our through line for the album. Um, and I think that from pressing play to the final track by Mark Shaman, which ties it up really nicely, um, I think it's a, a really great story that we're telling about what our community means. Well, speaking of Mark Shaman, it's... You Funny you mentioned him because that was tying into my next question. What was it like to work with the incomparable Mark Shaman for this album? I mean, when I saw that he was attached to this, I couldn't believe it. I mean, he's done so many incredible things. Uh, so what was that like? And, you know, did you know each other prior to this album or did you just meet for this? Well, Mark is, uh, I mean, obviously a, a giant star of composition and, and lyrics. Um, he is smart and funny and, you know, he's, he was writing things as far as I know, since he was a little kid as well, just like uh, to the tune of, uh, and then replacing lyrics and songs. And, and you know, I'm, I'm learning more about him all the time as, as this process goes on. But no, I connected to him through Andrew Gerla, my friend, um, for his last album. And I literally just uh, had Andrew write to Mark and I wrote to, to Mark as well, I think on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so <laughs> here's what happened. And here's what I'm thinking could happen if we all do this together. And I think because uh, the component of charity and the component of building new queer cultural traditions um, was a really big part of what I wanted to accomplish. I think that that um, was something he connected with on a personal level. And uh, he said, absolutely. <laughs> And he was literally the first composer to submit their completed track. And he had made a special request that he was able to use full orchestration. And it is this beautiful, lush track that Susie Mosher sings. And I'm so excited to share it with you. 
oh, well, I cannot wait to hear it. And, you know, it doesn't surprise me in, in true Mark Shaman style that he was the first to get it completed and do the full orchestra. You know, sort of on that with hearing it, when can we hear this album? When will it be available for us to listen to, to stream, to purchase? So this album, if we can make our deadline, will be out on the one year anniversary of my mother's passing, October 28th. It was important to me to have something to celebrate that day um, and to celebrate her memory and her work as somebody who did a lot of work with charity and food shelters through her whole life. Um, so hopefully it'll be the 28th and it'll be on all, all digital platforms that are available for streaming. Um, I would like to at some point possibly do a printing of an album, uh, but for now we're going digital. That's wonderful. Well, I certainly cannot wait to download the full album. As I told you earlier, I got to listen to some, you know, exclusive track privately and they sound beautiful and cannot wait um, to hear the rest. So sort of switching gears a little bit, you mentioned earlier about your clothing line. Can you tell me more about that and where did the inspiration come from? And, um, you know, what do you hope that people will get out of this line of clothing that you design? Well, this, I mean, clothing to me has always been something really personal because as a child, I never really felt comfortable in it, quite, quite literally. I had so much anxiety growing up and I was constantly bullied. Um, and clothes, instead of becoming a, a way to like express myself, became a, a costume I could hide in to feel safe around my peers who had ideas about me that were not positive. They were, they were really bullying me for a long time. And uh, uh, seven years ago, I was sexually assaulted and I developed a lot of depression and anxiety. And I literally started to have a lot of problems with sensory things. Um, my clothes felt too tight all the time. And so, when I was in quarantine, I was literally surrounded by all of my childhood memories from like the late 80s and early 90s, which if anyone knows, that's like very much the Lisa Frank pop 90s aesthetic, which I was so in love with, but was terrified to wear growing up. Um, so I, I talked to my friend Scott, who I saw was starting to do um, a couple of clothing items on this website he created called Tin Pin. And you can visit it at tinpin.com to see uh, more of the brand because we just put out some new backpacks and some notebooks, which is really exciting. But I really wanted to develop a clothing line that was gender optional. You could put gender onto any of these clothes if you wanted to, but really they're genderless. Anyone can wear them and they're gonna be for every age. We're gonna do an adult line that comes out this holiday season. And then it was also really important to me that it was sensory friendly, that for people, uh, on the spectrum, um, of which I'm very well acquainted, having had family members in that position, uh, they sometimes prefer to have clothing that's a little tighter, that has a bit of a hug to it. So we use a lot of lycra-based textiles. And then for people like me who need something a little looser, um, we have some really flowy styles. And I'm hoping to have some like A-line fabric dresses coming out in like soft jerseys so that people on the other side of that can also get what they need. Well, I love that. And you are just, you've done so much. You are doing so much and you're uh, inspiring so many. Um, before we wrap up here, please tell us where can we keep up with you, follow you, uh, give us the give us the plugs. Sure, sure. Um, you can always find me on my Instagram page, which is ryan.bauer.walsh on IG. And then my art page is rbwart. Um, it looks like RB Wart, but it's not. <laughs> And uh, of course on Tin Pin, you can find my major clothing line, um, Banana Duck. So that's a great place to find all those things. And they all offer kind of a different uh, aesthetic. Uh, my personal page is a lot of me wearing my mother's clothes as a way to celebrate her strength and kind of breaking the barriers of kind of heteronormativity and the, these really hyperbolic masculine Western stereotypes of gender, <laughs> which I'm pretty, pretty done with at this point, despite the tie. And then uh, my art and my commissions, um, which you can see this is, whoop, that's the album cover for the Rainbow Little Guy that I painted. Um, and you can find more of my paintings and uh, commission me from there as well. Well, that's a beautiful, beautiful photo. I mean, I, oh, and I love that that is the cover too. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. Listen, if you want to keep up with me, everyone watching, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Ryan underscore Myers. I'm not that active on TikTok right now, but I will be more. Uh, Ryan underscore Myers. 
Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, and official Rye Myers on Facebook. And another little treat for you, I'll be talking with Ryan again live in person um, on November 4th at my live digital, at my live in person show, Live with Ryan Friends on Broadway, which launched about four weeks ago. It's been a big success. Um, Ryan will be performing that night and we'll be talking and getting a little bit more in depth with this album and about everything he's created. So hope to see you on November 4th at 7.30 p.m. with Live with Ryan Friends on Broadway at Bar 9, 807 9th Ave between 53rd and 54th Street. It's Theater Thursdays at Bar 9, so make it your place to go on Thursdays. And I cannot wait to see everyone there. Ryan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me.